The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? The call came at 2 a.m. This is the North Ridgeville Fire Department. Your plant's on fire. Get out here fast. I arrived to find volunteer firemen spraying water on the outside of the building. We can't go in, one said. We don't know the plant, the layout, where the volatiles are. I assured them that I knew, and together we went into that inferno. We fought that fire all night, and it was only by the sun's rays streaking in through smoke-stained windows that we realized we hadn't lost everything, but the damage was horrendous. Structural steel twisted like pretzels. Piles of aluminum castings molted, melted into puddles on the floor. Wiring on the machinery singed to a crisp. I stood there in disbelief. I can still smell the smoke all these years later. I wondered, could we recover? When could we recover? What would it take? And then I recalled a pledge that I had made to Bernie. Bernie was the chief engineer of our largest customer, and just six months prior, he was one of the first to call after my dad died. Dad and I had worked together for just over a year. He was the mentor. I was the understudy. And now at 67, he was gone and his 26-year-old, very unproven son, was thrust into the helm. Our employees arrived moments later to survey the damage with me and I told them, I said, I've pledged to Bernie that we're not going to let them down. We're their sole supplier. That magnificent group of 12 grabbed brooms, shovels, pails, whatever it took, and launched into the reconstruction effort. Suppliers rallied, working around the clock to replenish our supplies. Machinery repair folks came in and, and replaced the wiring on our equipment. Even today, I cannot believe that we didn't miss a single shipment to Bernie's company or any other of our customers. I don't know how we did it. God's miracle, right? But those two experiences in the mid-60s made that year one of the most horrendous of my business career. And yet, as so often happens, a silver lining will pierce through the darkened clouds, and it did that year. I'd been rather self-sufficient, trying to lead by my own wits, uh, my own background and education, and it wasn't working. Not in a situation like this. I'd grown up in a uh, church family, but had not made uh, that vital commitment to the Lord that so many of you would be able to identify with tonight. But I had a wonderful example. My wife, Wendy, who's here with me tonight, uh, had become a Christian as a young girl. And she was a steady encourager and an inspiration to me. So pulled on the one hand by these unrelenting problems and pushed by the example of a loving wife, I yielded to the Lord and clearly what was the most <laughs> incisive and vital decision of my entire life. But as with Mr. Butt, who we just heard about, I had a dilemma. Because nobody that I knew who was serious about their faith was also engaged in the workplace. Quite the contrary. 
They were in some form of ministry. And so while I felt I was hardwired for business, I also felt that I was not serving God to the largest of my capabilities. Well, that changed with the arrival of a book that had been recommended by a friend of mine. Different Windows by Christian Overman, a school principal in Seattle, began to open a door for me that altered the trajectory of my thinking and frankly, my life. I want to show you with this rather low tech exhibit. There is life after PowerPoint. <laughs> the diagram that helped to unlock my understanding. You've probably seen this before, but it was new to me. And what Overman described uh, was a view of the world that had its roots in Greek philosophy, literally going back a thousand years before Christ. You know the names, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. They all bought into this idea of higher and lower. And as time progressed, uh, some of the AD folks, uh, Aquinas, uh, Augustine, picked up on the same theme and eventually the language became what we see here today, sacred and secular. And guess what? Up here were all the noble professions. Can you see these philosophers patting themselves on the back? Uh, these were the thinkers. These were the teachers, the academics, the intellectuals. The doers, the folks who got stuff done, were always down here in the secular realm. So you're, you're, you're seeing where I'm going with this now, right? My work in the workplace was structurally locked in to this lower sphere. So how could I view this as a high calling? This is where I was anchored. This idea, Greek dualism, so infects our society today that it's touching your life as well as mine. I'll just give you a little example. Suppose your son or daughter goes in to speak to uh, a pastor and says, what professions, what activities can I follow that will help me uh, align myself with the Lord's intent? You know the immediate responses, the default will be uh, church work, it will be missions, it will be go to Bible school. And how often are they taking a step back, <laughs> breathing as the young fellow said, and saying, you could have a career at IBM, you could have a career at Price Waterhouse, you could be a nursing professional, you could go into a family business. It doesn't happen. Why? Because those are secular. You can't be called to professions like that. And so we've gotten ourselves in this dilemma. In fact, you uh, know the name of A.W. Tozer, writing in the late 40s. So we do have some pioneers along the way. This is what he said. The common habit of dividing our lives into two areas, the sacred and the secular, is wholly unnecessary. It is a creature of misunderstanding. The secular, sacred antithesis has no foundation in the New Testament. Grateful for A.W. Tozer. But it took... Christian Overman to take me the next step. Now, what's the most distinguishing factor of this diagram? Voila! <laughs> no upper, <laughs> no lower. And this worldview, which I've chosen to call the integrated worldview, is not a product of the Greeks. The Greeks and the Hebrews had no love lost between them. This was the Hebrew view. This was the biblical view. And uh, just to drive home the point, I have uh, a number of different vocations here. They're face down. These are at random. But I just want to, sh I want to make a point to you. 
Whoops, how did that get there so soon? <laughs> do, you, do you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> Look, these are a variety of vocations, activities, and what, what is so significant about them is that they are what? Without rank. There is no higher or lower. You can put yourself and your vocation up here. This was such a breakthrough for me. I wanted to do cartwheels when I saw it. In fact, if I hadn't been a proper Episcopalian earlier in my life, I would have. It was revolutionary. Do you, do, you know, do you know the period of time that everybody thought the world was flat? You, you remember? You don't remember, of course, but it was. I don't think anybody remembers, right? But if you sailed far enough in one direction, you'd fall off the edge of the earth. I mean, that was the prevailing view. I was a flat earth guy. And now, the world was round. So, if you want to know why Sundays have a problem reaching over into Mondays, there's a big part of the explanation. I want to just go to this axis over here and say that how we implement, how we drive home the implications of this uh, is reflected not in higher or lower, but the question of whether these activities are in harmony with God's will, whether they align, or whether they're opposed. You see, it's a fundamentally different question. We don't ask the right question, we're, gonna, we're not going to get the right answer, right? So the question is, how can we purposely try to align our activities with God's will, God's purposes? And I'm going to just pick on two areas to connect these dots. Uh, the first is the importance of the Word of God, and the second is the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he was challenged by the Sadducees on the topic of marriage, pointed his finger at them, I think, and said, you err in two ways. One, you don't know the scriptures, and two, you don't know the power of the Holy Spirit. He was saying, I believe that these two are so foundational that we must not overlook them. So, um, let's just see how they play out here. Um, Wendy and I went to a seminar in the mid-70s. We really do go back that far. And the speaker said, I want to challenge you to be in the scriptures for five minutes a day. Anybody want to take that challenge? Up what my hand. Well, I kind of like challenges. I didn't know that it would be as challenging a challenge as it was because there were nights that I'd crawl into bed and, oh, nuts, you know, I forgot to read the scriptures and out would come the Bible and some toothpicks for the eyelids. And eventually that discipline started to become a delight. And it has now for four decades. Does it play into our work? Let me just give you a little real life example. We had a large customer, not the one I mentioned earlier, who decided that they were going to duplicate the product that we were supplying them. And they were going to do this to gain leverage over us so that they could drive home a significant price reduction, which frankly we couldn't do out of fairness to our other customers, right? There is such a thing as fairness even in the business world, true? <laughs> But I was stymied, what do I do? And uh, by this point, the scriptures had been pouring into the reservoir, okay, and now it was time to draw on that reservoir. And the scripture came to mind, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And you would know that this was given to Moses when he was at the Red Sea, right? Well, I was at my Red Sea. And uh, so it gave a peace that the Lord heard, the Lord was going to intervene. And I went into a meeting with our customer, which he initiated by saying, what are you going to do? Well, a word kind of flashed through my mind. I said, you've spent $2 million on this development. We're going to buy it from you. 
He went stone silent. He hadn't thought <laughs> of that. Well, we did. We worked out the details, got a five-year agreement to uh, secure their business, and came through that. They're still our customer today. But the Lord drew upon that reservoir and helped me. Let's just shift over to the importance of the work of the Holy Spirit. The final words that Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended were, wait here in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. That's how important the Holy Spirit was. E. Stanley Jones said, the power of the Holy Spirit transformed timid believers into irresistible apostles. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And we know they went out and turned the world upside down. We burn oil and gas for a living, and I was perplexed one day by a, a combustion issue that I just couldn't get my arms around. I'd been working on it for weeks, and I decided to just knock off all involvements with this. I went for a swim with our family, lofted a prayer, and during laps, the picture of how we could solve that problem became crystal clear. I couldn't wait to get back to the lab. I tried it, and it worked perfectly. The Holy Spirit was able to work in a design. It shouldn't surprise us, right? He's designed the atom. He's designed the universe. He can solve a technical problem if we'll ask him. So the Holy Spirit's at work. The Word is at work. Let me wind it up by just saying tonight how grateful I am to be with you and to be where God has me. The husband of Wendy, now 55 years, six children, 18 grandchildren, that at the right time he stepped into my life to give me new life and at the right time, he opened up my understanding that I could be called to full-time service and that that could be normative. It could be a first-class calling. I want to just leave four very short, challenging thoughts to you. The first is that you would extinguish any flickering flames of Greek dualism. It's important. Those thoughts are there. They are with me, and I have to work at it. Secondly, that you would pursue the integrated life. It's precious. It's beautiful. Third, that you would align in every way possible with God's will, God's intent, His Word, His Spirit. And then finally, that you, I, would live the life that he intends for us. I really believe that the Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, the crest of a wave, destined for great things. We here tonight are part of that very significant movement. Let's enjoy the journey. Thank you.